All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome to another edition of our Boxed Lunch episode. This month and next, we are focusing on our Original Works program. So we have nine submissions this year and another fabulous author joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming the one and only Aaron Settle. How you doing today, Aaron? I'm good, thank you. It's so nice to have you. And uh, I think it's been about a year since yeah. last we chatted. And it's uh, so nice to see you and uh, know that you're doing well. Before we delve into all the juicy details, do you mind taking a moment and just <laughs> introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do? All right, I'm Aaron Settle. I own a comic book store. This is my back room. Um, so lots of boxes of comics and toys and things hanging out behind me. Um, in addition to that, I, I've been writing things since I was eight. I've been writing plays for about a year and a half. So, um, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound so easy and simple, but, uh, I've, I've read your scripts. I know a lot more goes into it and sometimes it just, uh, uh, you, you just make it sound seamless, so. <laughs> I find the characters in my head and then I just follow them around and write what they do. So I mean, <laughs> they do the work. I just. Just I, jot it down. I, so. I just jot it down. I'm just a scribbler. I just, I do what they tell me. <laughs> now things are a little different for us this year. Last year we did the uh, author interviews right mm -hmm. up with the play readings. This year we're stretching things out a little bit and uh, giving people an opportunity to join us on uh, Mondays for box lunch and then the readings on Thursday nights. So um, before we get to your particular uh, script, what is on your lunch menu today? Cheesesteak from Cheesesteak House. It's my favorite cheesesteak ever. Nice. And do you go all in with uh, any special ingredients or is it just basic peppers, onions, and the meat and cheese? And cheese, yep. And it's funny, I, I hate the texture of peppers and onions, but I like what they do to the cheesesteak. So it gets hard, I pick them off and eat it. But <laughs> <laughs> Now, are you, uh, are you a Philly boy or uh, why, why cheesesteaks? I don't know. Um, I, I had one of the kid and loved them and some just actually, actually they used to make me steak them when I was a kid and which is, you know, just bad cheesesteak. <laughs> so I thought steak them was the best thing in the world. And then someone finally said, no, eat this. And they said, oh, okay. That's what I like. <laughs> Well, I am excited to see it. I also have a little bit of a dine and dash today. So I'm going with a BLT wrap from Yogi's Deli and Grill, which is right up the road for me over on Hewlin. So check them out and, uh, and we'll uh, wow each other with our presentation at the end of the interview as we wrap up. So. So Aaron, it has been a year. I cannot even believe it. Yes. We started lockdown with our original work series last year, literally almost to the day. And here we are again. <laughs> so I'm very curious, how has your playwriting in particular been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, I've had more time to do it <laughs> because there's nowhere else to go. So, I mean, I've had, um, it, and the other thing is just dealing with uh, just the feelings that the pandemic has caused, the isolation and things kind of inf inform a lot of things I've been thinking about and working on because when you're isolated you want to be with people and so i i think that need for community has come across in a lot of things i've been working on lately gotcha now i'm curious your submission this year was it written during the uh, pandemic or were there oh, yeah. pieces and parts that were done before 
No, I was actually working on something else and I hit a speed bump and I said, okay, well, the two characters jumped in my head and I said, I'll follow you down the street. And then it's like, oh, okay, here we go. So yeah, no, I, I think I started writing it in August. And, and once then, again, was writing up to the deadline. Wow, I was going to say, that's really not very long at all. I'm surprised. August, September. So that was literally just, what, five months or so? Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And uh, uh, the name of your script is <laughs> How We Met and Other Lies We Told Our Parents. Now, I never lied to my parents, ever. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. Did you? Uh, did that happen a lot in your family, or is this just the characters uh, uh, that are actually doing the uh, the missing? Just the characters. Just the characters. Yeah. I'm a bad liar. <laughs> I've been a bad liar all my life, Every, and everyone always tells me that you're a horrible liar. Is that a bad thing? Is it a bad thing that I'm not good at deceiving people? <laughs> so, Aaron, um, what have you learned about yourself as a storyteller this last year? I'm you always ask me hard questions. <laughs> I should know better now. Um, I think I think I've learned partially how to let things not to rush into the story. I've gotten better at, you know, letting things develop. And I think that also might be a part of what we were talking about earlier about the need for community and things and the need to, for people because we're not having as many conversations as we used to have because we're not having as many social gatherings and things. And so I think I've gotten better at dialogue and conversations and interpersonal relations and trying to reflect that in how I tell stories. Nice. Now, have you found that uh circumstances or storylines have changed ha has the uh, has the pandemic put uh, um, different perceptions in your head about uh, writing styles I know that uh, uh, you uh, from what I've read anyway with your scripts they tend to have a a, a family uh, dynamic to them um, uh, people coming together and working out uh, uh, internal relationships, I guess. And so uh, is that a, a, a consistency with you that you try to stay with? Or do you see yourself um, uh, writing outside of your box, so to speak, more about uh, uh, social issues, uh, uh, things along those lines? I I do tend to stay within the family dynamics and the, and the small stories. Um, like I said, I follow the characters. If the characters if the characters wander into that realm and that kind of story, then that's where we'll go. But they haven't yet. Well, they will eventually, and I'll fill over my head. But. <laughs> <laughs> So um, do you mind telling us just a little bit about your submission this year? Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a little convoluted, but um, <laughs> basically it's a guy who's very socially awkward, doesn't know how to talk to women, doesn't, only talks to a couple people whose sister convinces him to bring what he believes is her, her girlfriend to meet their family and pass her off as his girlfriend. So they'll, so they'll like her basically, but everyone has different plans and nothing, and nothing's like it seems. Yes. Now I, uh, I remember, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, your submission last year had a, uh, a little bit of magic in it, if you will. Yes. And, uh, and I noticed uh, when I read this one this year, there's a little bit of sleight of hand there as well, but it <laughs> seems to be uh, uh, a little bit more in the uh, relationship dynamic than a, yeah. uh, uh, than a magic wand. So exactly. where, did the, uh, 
where'd the inspiration come for this particular uh, script that you submitted this year? Um, my daughter likes stupid romantic comedies. And so I always try to think of different ways to get people together and do those kind of silly romantic comedy things. And I hadn't seen this exact thing yet. So it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a shot. And, and then, and then, like I said, I, I started thinking about the characters and they started populating and then they did their own thing. I, while I was writing it, I told my wife, I was like, I, was, I wrote a scene and found out something I had no idea I, because there's a whole bit about the guy being obsessed with donuts and buying out the donut shop and that was just spontaneous as they were talking. It's like, oh, oh. <laughs> well, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I'm always so curious uh, uh, what comes from truth and uh, and what comes from fiction. I don't want to give spoilers away or any of that, huh. uh, yeah. but I am kind of curious. Uh, are you a, a a fan of playlists yourself, yes. or uh, is that uh, something that was uh, uh, fictionalized? Oh no, I do playlists. I um, I do playlists for everything I write, and so I have a list and when I'm working on something I I play it in the car constantly and it, it it helps the characters wander around in my head and so like the one that we did the reading for last year I had a playlist of all the songs that were that were either referenced or inspired scenes and stuff and so I was thinking about that when I started doing this and so I So I made, and as it went, um, the playlist grew and it got more important as the story progressed. It's like, oh, so then of course you have to go back and fix it and make it so it, it, it's a cohesive whole. But yeah, I, I do a lot of playlists. <laughs> <laughs> now that kind of leads me into uh, to my next question. And I think I already know the answer, but I would like to hear you uh, touch on it a little bit. Um, was this particular script based on people you know or fictional characters? Um, some people I know, some of the family dynamics are real, and then some people are fictional. <laughs> um, Lexi's fictional. It's funny. I always wanted, I don't know, I wanted to write a play with someone named Lexi in it, and so I I tried to push her into a couple and it didn't work and it didn't work. And then I started writing this and then this character just popped up and she's like, hi, I'm Lexi, follow me, you'll be fine. And it was, so. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's really a, a fun script and some really uh, uh, great characters in there. I love the uh, uh, the little twist on uh, uh, mistaken identities. And, uh, <laughs> and so it was really a lot of fun to read and uh, always a joy to, uh, uh, to see the stuff that you're working on. So, so Aaron, how do you see uh, the arts adapting now that uh, businesses are uh, starting to reopen and restructure? Um, where do you see uh, live theater going and adapting to? Um, yeah, it's already starting a little. You get people who are already starting to figure out how to do uh, the seating with the social distancing and stuff. So we're getting there. Um, my daughter's uh, school actually, they didn't have an audience, but she did the lighting design on a show which had a full cast. And so they managed to actually put something out there and then just streamed it. But, but they had the actors together and everything and they didn't wear masks, but they had masks off stage and they came, they did their stuff and they left. And so so people are figuring out, people are adapting and figuring out how to do that now. Gotcha. And uh, have you as an author uh, consumed more uh, art or scripts during the pandemic than you did prior to it? Yes. Yes, I've <laughs> been looking at lots of stuff. <laughs> I can only imagine. So, so I'm curious then, um, has the pandemic helped or hurt your writing process? 
Well, I've been more productive than I ever have been, so I guess it helped it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, you've got several things out and around, I believe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, possibly some of the other things that you've uh, had um, uh, uh, read or uh, uh, virtually uh, uh, performed during the pandemic? Um, yeah, the Tap House Theater did a thing called Shelter in Place, which was a virtual um, festival of pandemic themed plays. And I had one uh, I presented there called the art of hugging in the age of social distance. And yeah, I, I, I like long titles. <laughs> uh, what was it like? Uh, and so. Uh, oh, go ahead, Aaron, sorry. Oh, um, and it was basically about um, a woman who was having a hard time not being able to hug people and a gentleman who had just lost his dog and was having a hard time relating to people. And so they find each other and have a conversation, so. Nice, and uh, as an author yourself, um, do you see your work differently when it's presented virtually as opposed to uh, on a stage with uh, live people and in the room with it happening? I can't answer that because I haven't seen anything in my life yet. Everything I've <laughs> seen has been performed virtually. So I, I don't know how I'm going to freak out when I actually see people in front of me doing it. <laughs> <laughs> what but do I will you, freak out. And so uh, uh, what do you anticipate those differences being? I mean, obviously, outside of them standing there, do you... Uh, do you feel like it's the uh, the physicality of the actors, the uh, mood of the room? As an author, where does that um, uh, synchronicity happen? Is it just in the words as a writer? Or do you already perceive movements, uh, uh, emotional gestures, light, sound? Um, I, I'm just curious about that. Does the whole thing play out in your head when you're writing, or is it just about the content of the words and building that ladder of language? I see everything when I when I visualize it. I see how it, it all interconnects in my head. And I mean, that's not to say that someone else won't interpret it different and make it look different, but I have a vision in my head of what it would look like. And so, yeah, music, lighting, everything. So uh, that's where I'm curious to see is when one of my things is done where it has all the thing. And the audience is the other thing because when I watch something virtual, I clap, but it's not the same. As, and I laugh, but I don't, but, but I sit there and go, I wonder if the people in front of their screens laughed. Did they get it? Did they like that joke? <laughs> Now, so you don't uh, get that feedback. Right, sure, absolutely. So I'm curious, this is something that I always like to ask authors as well, because I'm always curious as an actor, um, are you a fan of uh, stage direction? Do you find yourself putting a lot of that uh, leash in a script as well? Or do you only do that if you feel it's uh, essential to a moment or uh, uh, some sort of a, a uh, story arc that needs to be uh, uh, stressed a little bit. So I'm, I'm always curious if people uh, as authors write the stage direction or are you a person that just wants to see uh, how it plays out and shapes itself beyond the, uh, the language? It, if I think that there are too many choices that won't get me to where I need to be down the road. Then I'll, then I'll put in what I think needs to be there to get farther down the road. If not, I'll just let it be and let people have their own reactions and stuff. Because sometimes I need a glare or something from somebody to set up something two pages later. And if I don't get it, if they make a, if they make a different choice, then the payoff isn't there two pages later. 
Gotcha. But if that's not the case, then I just let people do what people are going to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that easy or is that hard for you as an author to let people shape your story? Yeah. Um, it's getting easier. Um, it's funny. The last one, uh, Bear, who played Steffi, found things in her that I hadn't seen. So when I went back and did a draft afterward, I started moving towards that. So I'm like, she found a softer side to the character that I hadn't seen before. So then I went back and nurtured that a little in the subsequent drafts and said, oh, here. Wow. It's, uh, it's always so amazing to me to hear how these stories uh, take shape. And um, I think a lot of people, they just kind of assume that what they see is where an author started. <laughs> How many drafts of this particular uh, piece and submission did you do? Or was it just minimal rewrites? Or did you literally just knock it out and send it in? Um, parts of it were rewritten four or five times. Parts of it, the first thing I put on the page stayed. Um, as it's probably the third overall draft. Wow, that's even more impressive that you got all that done in such a short amount of time. So what's harder to write, emotion or action? I think action's harder to write, especially for the stage, just because you're limited with your space, you're limited with resources and things. If you're writing for the screen, you can blow shit up and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do that on stage too. You just it, need it, uh, it, you just a little more uh, uh, yeah. planning and preparation, I think. Right. So, you and go. you need to make sure the fire alarm's working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Aaron, it's been a year of pandemic and uh, uh, that uh, uh, word that everyone loves to use, pivoting. And um, have you, uh, do you, do you see uh, more script demand from playwrights with the focus on digital theater growing? Have uh, some of your colleagues been uh, commissioned or um, has there been more of a, a outreach for, uh, for playwrights and, and authors in general? I've seen a whole lot of submission um, opportunities for things to be performed in a virtual mode. So I, so I think so. I think a lot of people who aren't ready to go back to live with people in their people in their locations, but they want to keep doing theater have been moving to that virtual model. And since the, that wasn't really a genre. I mean, people weren't writing for that. So right now there's a void that could be filled. Do you hear your uh, inner artistic voice uh, shaping the way uh, you're writing future projects? Is that changing the way that you uh, hear your characters? Is uh, uh, Are they speaking to you from... Uh, a virtual uh, platform rather than a stage platform? Or will you always be a playwright and always see it and hear it live and in front of an audience? Um, it depends on the project. Um, Cause some of the things that I've written, I've written with that in mind, it's like, what if this is virtual? What if they're not in the same location? We can't do this, we can't do this. This won't play as well. So then I start thinking, well, what can we do? But like I said, it it, it depends on the story. Cause like one, one thing I'm working on now is a horror comedy. It can't, it won't work virtually. It, it would have to be everyone together. So I just have to go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, have you uh, have you written any screenplays or novels or short stories, or do you just consider yourself uh, to be a, a playwright, or is that who speaks to you 
is uh, characters for the stage? Um, when I was younger, I wrote short stories. Um, and then for a while I wrote um, screenplays. I, I made three or four short films. I made a actual feature length film that we made for maybe $250. <laughs> nice. But then, but as my kids got more into theater and I wanted to do things with them. So I started gravitating towards things that they were interested in. And so that I started writing plays. And then I have a 25 year old daughter who is an actor and she's like there's this gap there's not enough roles for women so the first one that you guys did last year it was all women I wrote a play four female leads with no men at all this time we got two men but we still have four women so. now was that just for a different point of view or is that just <laughs> did you feel you needed that in there no it just it's just where the story was. This story had guys in it. The last story didn't. Interesting. Yeah, I just find that uh, uh, so fascinating how uh, how these characters uh, come to life. Now, now you mentioned one of your daughters. Uh, they're both in the uh, uh, theatrical realm as well. We had the uh, uh, benefit of visiting with uh, Zoe on one of our box lunches. <laughs> Yeah. And you, you mentioned that your other daughter is a uh, lighting designer as well. Is that correct? Yes, she's at, um, she's in her last semester of college. And then, but yes, she's a lighting designer. She's designed several shows up there and a couple. She, did, uh, she designed Dialed In for Murder that Garland Civic Theater did a year or so ago. So she's even designed locally, so. Awesome. And whenever they get out of school and and truly finish up, are you just going to start your own production company with your family? <laughs> Zoe has said she wants to have a theater company at some point, so if she does, you know, we support. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a wonderful dad you are. There's, uh, there's no other answer, is there? <laughs> so Aaron, do you have any uh, tips or tricks on uh, how to stay sane through all of these uh, uh, crazy times and uh, and continue to fulfill yourself artistically in the midst of a, a continuing pandemic? Um, just don't take yourself too seriously. I mean, that's the only thing I can say. If you can't laugh at yourself, you're going to have problems. Yeah, uh, there has been a lot of uh, internal giggling from me yeah. <laughs> over the course of the last 12 yeah. months. So. So Aaron, I'm curious, uh, what helpful uh, community resources are you personally seeing or using and how can playwrights be assisted or provide assistance to other artists or organizations? I told you, quit asking me hard questions. <laughs> It's mainly Facebook groups is what I use. I, that's where I see submission opportunities and stuff. I find them on Facebook groups and stuff. Zoe finds stuff and sends them to me too. She's like, hey, they're looking for a short play, right ones. Okay. <laughs> because like um, Union Coffee in Dallas is going to do a little short play that I wrote at some point when they can have people in their spot again. But she found it and she's like, um, that they want to pay a play under five pages. Can you write one? It's like, yeah, probably. And so <laughs> I actually have, I have fun with those kind of things. I just wrote something for a festival that all the plays are supposed to be 60 seconds or less. So it's like, can I write a whole play in 60 seconds? And so it turns out I can. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So um, I'm, I'm curious there, Aaron, uh, are you about ready to uh, do our presentation here? And sure. I'll let you get back to work. We'll continue <laughs> prepping on your script for this upcoming Thursday. But awesome. I am awful curious if you're uh, uh, ready for some presentation with our sure. lunches here. And I'm yep. just absolutely dying. 
to see the uh, Philly Philly uh, cheesesteak there. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah, okay. That looks pretty good. And what's the name of that place again? Cheesesteak House. I find any place that it, it is just a name and a house or a hut or something is always going to be good. Pancake House. That yeah. is one of my favorites. So, <laughs> All right. So here's my reveal on the uh, BLT wrap there. It's even got a little avocado in there. Wow. So I'm, uh, I'm looking Fancy. forward to that as well. And uh, here in just a second, we'll bid bon appetit to everyone and uh, give each other a thumbs up and see how everybody did today. So, Aaron, this is probably the most important question I'm going to ask you today. How and where can people find you and keep up with all of the great work that you continue to put out there? Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, I have to get better at that, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not good at self promotion. I'm bad at this game. Well, I'm going to help you a little bit. Do you okay. have a Facebook page? I do. And that is. I think it says Aaron Soto. I don't. Even I, I think you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, you're also, um, you're reachable on some playwright uh, websites as well. Is that correct? Um, yeah, um, I am on, uh, what's it? I'm sorry, Jason. I'm you're quite all right. That's the beauty of, uh, of doing these spontaneously. So <laughs> um, do you have any uh, other social media outside of uh, uh, Facebook? Uh, yes, I'm on Twitter as well. Um, okay, because New Play Exchange is what I'm on. There you go. New Play Exchange, Aaron Settle. So yeah. I'll tell you what, Aaron, I'm going to help you out and we're going to get some links in the okay. comments <laughs> of this interview just so we can drive some more traffic your way awesome. because uh, you're telling some great stories and seriously, oh, those, those, uh, those family dynamics are... Uh, uh, really something special. And there's some beautiful characters in this one and um, and some really, really uh, uh, fun situations. And again, I don't want to give any spoilers away. Right. But we will certainly encourage everyone to join us this upcoming Thursday and uh, stay tuned to the uh, Art Center's uh, Facebook page. And we'll keep everybody posted on uh, times and where you can find those. So Aaron, before we wrap up, any uh, words of wisdom or advice for everybody out there? I'm sorry, I'm bad, no. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Aaron, but I hope always... everyone enjoys the show on Thursday, I really do. I, I, I hope they have as much fun as I did writing it. Well, uh, it's easy when you have great characters and words in front of you. I, uh, I guarantee you they're gonna have a blast and uh, hopefully our audience joining us will too. So. Yeah. Um, all right, my friend. Well, I think that uh, does it for us. Wraps up another edition of our Box Lunch episodes. We'll be back next Monday with another one. And Aaron, this is when we sign off. So you just pick up your Philly cheesesteak. We say bon appetit, everyone. Have a safe week. We'll see you guys real soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>